All right. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is uh, Mark Malloy with Emerging Revolutionary War. Uh, very happy uh, to have you all with us this evening. Uh, welcome our, our guest, uh, Dr. Stephen Park, uh, who is the author of the book, The Burning of His Majesty's Schooner Gatsby, um, which is uh, a, a great book about uh, the event we're going to be talking about tonight, which is the burning of the Gatsby, uh, which happened uh, 250 years ago, just a few days ago, uh, June 9th and 10th of 1772. So, uh, you know, here at Emerging Revolutionary War, we really want to try and focus a lot on the 250th anniversaries as they, as they start coming up. Um, and this was an uh, often overlooked uh, event uh, in American history. It happened right off the coast of Rhode Island. And, uh, and, and we're really proud to be able to have uh, Stephen here tonight to, to talk about this event. And hopefully we can talk about uh, kind of the, the responses to what happened and how this has been remembered over the years. Uh, or forgotten uh, by some, uh, but a uh, very, very interesting history and, and glad you can uh, uh, come on here. Stephen, if you want to go ahead and uh, introduce yourself to our, uh, our, our audience uh, and kind of your background and, uh, and how you got into uh, this uh, often overlooked event, the burning of the Gatsby. Sure. So like you said, my name is Stephen Park. I was working on a a PhD in American history in Eastern Connecticut at uh, the University of Connecticut at Storrs. And I was looking for a dissertation topic, really, um, to be quite honest, at a time when the Amistad was all on everybody on the tip of everybody's tongue, the uh, feature length film was coming out and book after book, and very highly respected scholars were writing about the Amistad. And I thought, is there another maritime incident like this, right, uh, that I could focus on in Southern New England, where I don't have to travel the world to to do multi archival research where you know most of the documents I would need would be right here in southern New England and, and so I was looking for. Uh, something that was a little more convenient to do and and so uh, I found that only one person had ever written a dissertation on the Gatsby affair back in 1973 a man named uh, Lawrence Devaro and he just passed away in 2020 so um, um so uh, Lawrence lived to a ripe old age, but I called him and I said. Uh, you know, did you read all the documents in Rhode Island? And he said, indeed, I did. And I said, well, now with the internet, I can see that there's about 350 documents in the public record office in the United Kingdom. Uh, has any American looked at those recently? And he's like, not to my knowledge. And I said, so if I could get to England, there might be more to the story here than, than meets the eye. And he said, yes, Governor Wanton, the governor of Rhode Island, was required to bag everything up at the end of the Gatsby affair and ship it to Whitehall. And so those, those are actually the original documents, uh, so he thought. And he said, um, I was working at Case Western Reserve in Ohio. We would go to Rhode Island in the summer to visit my, my wife's family. And so I was able to see all the documents there in Rhode Island, but I never made it to England. So that was my contribution. I took a digital camera, an early digital camera to England, photographed those 350 documents, built them into a small database for myself. It took me months to read those. Um, I had to read 18th century roundhand. Some people have better handwriting than others, you know, and, um, and it, but it gave me some new insights for this book and to push back on some of our traditional assumptions. Um, but Mark, would you like me to just give you a quick five minute quick and dirty of what the Gatsby Affair is? Yeah, okay. you know, I think a lot of our audience, I mean, this might be their first uh, introduction to it. So many of them may never even heard of it. So yeah. Sure, go. sure. So that's sort of how I, I how I got into it personally and, and who I talked to, to to make sure that this was something that needed to be done. But um, it was well known enough at the time that uh, on its second anniversary, George Washington fired off fireworks to celebrate the Gatsby affair. And, and I'll get into how who helped give it a legacy and how we know about it. But um, just to go back to 1763 really quick, um, at the end of the French and Indian War, or what the Europeans called the Seven Years War, um, there was a need to really have a brighter dividing line between Indian country and Anglo country. And the Appalachian Mountains were going to be that line, the, the proclamation line of 1763. And, and King George III wanted to have maybe as many as 10,000 soldiers um, in 14 different battalions along the Appalachian Ridge and then another 20 to 25 vessels at sea that would make up the North American squadron uh, with an admiral based in Boston. 
who would help uh, protect that at his Anglo uh, colonies. And um, part of it was really to kind of leave the Indians alone, quit messing with you, get out of these Indian wars. They're costly, they're expensive, and they had made promises at the end of the French and Indian War to these Indian tribes. But then also to keep the French and the Spanish and, well, all to keep the fishing grounds and to patrol that and to kind of keep the eastern seaboard safe as well. So the Gatsby was one of six schooners and sloops that were purchased um, in 1764 um, and given French place names. So there was the Magdalene and the St. Lawrence and the Gatsby. These were all places in Quebec, in French-speaking Canada, um, to sort of celebrate the victory over the French and, and to, um, to honor these place names in Canada. And so the Gatsby was one of those. In 1768, it was made into a schooner. They took it to the careening yard in Halifax. Later over on its side, added another uh, uh, mast. So now you have two sails instead of one. You have two masts instead of, of one. So you get more square sail area up in the air to give you a little bit more sailing power, but you don't need any more men to sail the vessel. You have a, still a pretty small crew, maybe 19 men could sail the Gatsby. You have eight swivel guns, 49 feet. It's a small vessel, but that's the idea. You want a small vessel that can go in close to shore into shallow water in the winter because that's how smuggling takes place. Smugglers operate in the winter is their peak season. They go in close to shore away from the crowded docks and the busy ports where they're gonna be seen, where they can have a lot of privacy. They go into shallow areas and that's how they get away with it. So in 1772 in January, actually late December of 71, Montague sends orders to Lieutenant, Admiral Montague is the, uh, the commander of the entire uh, North Atlantic, uh, North American fleet. He's in Boston. He sends orders to Dunnington and says, please go up in an Narragansett Bay and patrol. Now, we don't know exactly what those orders are because they were destroyed. This is what everybody wanted to know, what the, these orders were. So by January, he's, he's already made his way to Narragansett Bay. By February, he um, sees the, some smuggled rum from a powerful, the powerful Green family. Jacob Green was actually the owner of the fortune, the name of the vessel. But you recognize the Green family name from Nathaniel Green you know, George Washington's right-hand man who single-handedly won the American Revolution for the rest of us. So a great Rhode Island hero, right? He's, um, <laughs> and so, uh, well, uh, well, you know, so this is about the powerful Green family. So by March, Dunningston gets a, a court date up in Boston to have this rum condemned. And it starts a caustic correspondence among uh, the Admiral up in Boston, Governor Watson, who's a democratically elected governor of Rhode Island. Remember Connecticut and Rhode Island, still had democratically elected governors who weren't royal appointments, um, and Dunningston himself. So there's a three-way communication. And these letters are now online. One of the things that happened with COVID, Mark, is um, the Secretary of State in, in Providence didn't want um, her staff to get furloughed during COVID. So she said, you know what? The Gatsby's coming up. Why don't you guys digitize all those documents and put them online? So it gave her archivist something to do when everybody was sort of locked down during COVID because their public facing programs were really, you know, ha hamstrung by COVID. And so um, her staff did a great job putting up a fantastic display that just went public back on May 4th. Um, so you could read these documents if you can read 18th century roundhead, right? If you can read the, the writing. Um, but in any case, uh, by uh, April, uh, Lieutenant, sorry, Admiral Montague gets nervous for the safety of the Gatsby, sends another vessel to Narragansett Bay to help protect her. So they kind of can see this coming. You know, they're not, they shouldn't have been completely surprised. Um, and then by May, um, the uh, Admiral Montague warns the beaver and the captain to not to go ashore. You know, the, I, I fear for your safety. And then by June, of course, June 9th, uh, we know that the, the Gatsby runs aground somebody coming at probably Abraham Whipple and John Brown coming out claiming to be a sheriff and a, and a sea captain of some kind, uh, claiming to have an arrest warrant for Dunningston, somebody, probably Buckland, um, probably Joseph Buckland, uh, took a gun and somewhat impulsively shot Dunningston, almost killed him. He thought he was going to die that night. Uh, he lived into old age um, and it didn't even hurt his career that he lost his ship. Um, he went on to become an admiral uh, during the Napoleonic Wars. But in any case, um, they moved everybody ashore and then the vessel burns, which makes it seem intentional, right? You know, if it had been an accident, if the fire started by accident, 
why did they move everybody ashore, right? But they claimed they were looking for Dunnington's orders. Uh, they heard some splashes. So either they went into a boat or they went into the water and they were looking for Jacob Green's rum, which either went into the water or went into some boats. Um, so they went out and they attacked the, uh, Dunningston, they attacked the Gatsby, burned the Gatsby. Um, a man named Daniel Vaughn was hired to salvage what the, he could from the Gatsby. He claims he took some iron fittings to a warehouse and the cannon to a warehouse and those have been lost to history. We don't know where those are. So the, um, the local government immediately followed up with a hundred pound um, reward for any information for any perps that, or any information um, about who was involved. Everybody went completely quiet. Nobody talked. Nobody talked for decades. That hmm. nobody said anything till the 1820s, um, and so everybody went silent. And then, um, so the Crown got wind of this in August, and they offer a 500 pound reward for any information. Still, nobody talks. Nobody says anything. And they co uh, commissioned a royal commission of inquiry, which is a research committee. It's not a court. They don't have any. Um, any authority in terms of jurisprudence because Rhode Island already had a court system. They couldn't put a new court system in place, but it's a, it's a research committee. They find nothing. And, and so one of the findings from my research, Mark, is that um, the 19th century historian said, oh yeah, Governor Watson was very zealous in his duties. He was very thorough. Um, look, when the revolution came, he sided with the crown. So he was, he was really kind of a closet loyalist. I'm sure he was very zealous in his duties and trying to find, he wasn't. I put a chart in my book. You can see that he had all the Gatsby Mariners come and, and stand in front of him one day of the week. And then he had the accused come stand in front of him another day of the week and never the twain shall meet. They, <laughs> they wouldn't pass in the hallway. They wouldn't see each other. They would, didn't face each other in court. So he carefully protected his friends. Um, <laughs> everybody in Colonial Rhode Island was intermarried. They were all related to each other. They all did business together. They all patted each other on the back. He made sure that none of his friends got him into any trouble. So um, <laughs> well, in his, his final report, Governor Watson spends almost a fifth of the report patting himself on the back on what a thorough job they did. Um, he really obstructed justice. And, and that's one of the findings of my book. Um, and, and then another finding of my book is how did something that was just a customs raid, you know, um, I mean, not to belittle it, but it's not that unusual. How did this become a huge affair when nobody in Rhode Island could talk about it? Well, the way it became a huge affair was a, a little known Baptist minister in Boston named John Allen preached a sermon on December 3rd, 1772 at the invitation of the Sons of Liberty at Second Baptist Church in Boston. Uh, he preached a sermon that just went viral. It just took off. Um, he published it as a pamphlet seven times and he published it in city after city, all the way down to Wilmington, Delaware. Um, so it, it started traveling south. And um, John Adams' legal assistants and some of his students who were studying with him in his firm told him, they said, you, you know, Mr. Adams, the men who can't read John Allen's sermon are having it read to them. That's how <laughs> important it is. So when you go into the pubs in Boston in the evening, you hear people reading it out loud. So it went through seven printings and you say, well, is that a big deal? It is. When you look at the 400 pamphlets that came out before July 4th, 1776, there are 400 pamphlets uh, uh, where we're fighting the revolution on paper before it happened, right? Um, it's in the top 10. Alan's, it's, it's up there, it, you know, obviously common sense is way out front, mm -hmm. but at, after common sense, it's right up there with the big players. It's in the top 10. And I have a chart in my book where, where I show this. And so you can see how important John Allen's sermon was. But the thing that's interesting to us now in 2022 is two of his, he had to keep moving to different cities to get it published. The reason is he was trying to get an addendum published on there. And the addendum was an extra seven pages about the rights of Africans. He's really an abolitionist. He's a proto-abolitionist, I guess. So at a time when mostly only Quakers held, held what was kind of considered a little bit of a fringe belief, not a mainstream belief. Um, he was advocating for the rights of, of African and African-Americans um, before it was cool. And, and so in that sense, Alan comes out as the real hero of the story. Um, the Brown family has watched their stock only fall in my lifetime. Um, in 2003, Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island started a study group to look at their past. 
And in 2006, they came out with a report where they're really showing how the Brown family was deeply involved in the slave trade. And it's not a proud moment in Rhode Island history or in the history of the university. They came out with another study last year in 2021, again, showing the same thing, where people are not putting up statues to the Brown family right now. Um, but John Allen's the one who really comes out as the hero of the story, advocating for the rights of all colonists, um, whether they're Anglos or, or whether they're um, or whether they're African uh, descent. So uh, that's sort of the quick quick version of the story in a nutshell of, of how we get here. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's really interesting. Um, uh, when you talk about uh, John uh, John Allen writing this um, pamphlet. Uh, is he the one that, you know, were these men who actually boarded and uh, took them off? You know, it sounds like it was a, uh, you know, defending their smuggling or, or business or whatever. Uh, is it Alan that, that ties it to this broader uh, cause of uh, uh, going against British rule overall? Or is that, uh, and, and how involved were these men that, that were involved in the affair? uh involved with the sons of liberty uh that you mentioned uh you know were, were these were these patriots or were these were these men just trying to kind of you know continue their business unabated yeah so the, the thing is, is to, you know with the advantage of 2020 hindsight we look back at these men and we see their involvement in committees of correspondence and then their involvement in with the sons of liberty and with the cause and with signing up on the patriot side of the cause and so it's easy but they, of course, we didn't know any of that in 1772, right? They didn't know what was coming. And, you mm -hmm. know, this is all the advantage of 2020 hindsight. And like I said, no patriot told his side of the story until the 1826, at the 50th anniversary, um, men started showing up in the Bristol Day Parade. You know, Bristol has the, the very famous 4th of July parade. Um, men started putting it in their obituaries. They, they would say, I was there that night. And mm -hmm. we could do the backwards engineering and we can go back and look. Oh yeah, he was 19 years old. He worked for John Brown. He lived in Providence. He was actually there, you know, he was in Providence that week, you know, you know, and you can kind of see that his story probably checks out, you know, he's probably telling the truth. You know, you never know for sure, but certainly when, uh, so, um, but we do have uh, an account of a Dr. Monty, who was the doctor who helped treat Lieutenant Dunnington's wounds. And we have a, the, the telling of Ephraim Bowen. Um, so we have two, uh, stories of, of men who told well, as older men 50 60 years later looking back um, and they tell a very similar story uh, which gives it some credence but um, yeah but we, so we don't we don't know for sure hmm. yeah and, and was this the would there, would there were there other um, you know similar events happening of attacks on these um, patrol boats uh, in Narragansett Bay? Or? Yeah, so there were a lot of attacks on the Customs Service from 1696 up to the Revolution. And um, the thing that, that the Crown really did wrong, here's the big mistake that they made, Mark. In 1763, they looked at having to lay off a whole bunch of seafarers and a whole bunch of officers and sea officers. And that's caused problems for them in the past as so many unemployed men, well, actually they get half pay, right? So they're, they're sort of semi-retired. And they said, you know what, we have we have good, honest work for you. We'll keep you at sea now doing customs enforcement and you'll hold two commissions. So you have your commission as a sea officer in the Royal Navy and you have a commission in the customs service. Well, there'd been a lot of attacks against customs officers. There'd been violence against them. There'd, been, there'd even been some custom vessels that had been set on fire. That wasn't that unusual. By merging the two, now you're attacking the Navy and they can't turn a blind eye to that now. So where they could kind of sweep it under the carpet before, they, they can't do that now. Now they've got to follow up with some sort of administrative response. The weakness of this response, of course, makes Rhode Islanders think that this emboldened the folks in Boston for the Tea Party. Mm -hmm. So when so little happened as a consequence of the Gatsby, they're like, you know what? We probably could get away with throwing all this tea in the harbor. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> and in some ways, throwing the tea in the harbor seems like a lesser offense than actually destroying one of his majesty's vessels on station that was manned, you know? And so um, in that sense, it seems like a lesser act. And so that's the thing that Rhode Islanders will be quick to point out. And um, you can pull up Senator Whitehouse's speeches on YouTube and see him telling that to his fellow US senators every, every June. So 
Yeah. <laughs> well, and so in, and I mean, it's also interesting. Yeah. Cause uh, you have an actual, you know, shots fired and a person actually wounded. Um, it's uh, yeah. It's interesting that there's yeah not more of a, a push to, to, to make that the, the first shot of the, the revolution or whatever. I think it's interesting because that's pretty, pretty serious. So. Yeah. So by 1876, you can find uh, teacups that were printed and different things that were printed for the centennial. And it was called First Blow for Freedom or First Shot Fired. And so Rhode Islanders were already saying that um, in 1876, that this was the first shot fired, um, even though that's not te technically true. And, and of course, we didn't know we were uh, on the cusp of a revolution at that point. But as we look back, um, and I think there's even a registered trademark on that phrase, First Blow for Freedom. I don't think you and I are allowed to use that phrase. I think it's a registered trade. But in any case, um, let's see, I've got it up here on my shelf somewhere. I have a whole little museum here in my office of Gatsby paraphernalia. I could find out who has who has the trademark on that. But well, and I think that's one of the neat things about this is that you know you know Rhode Island has kind of taken a lot of pride in this event. Um, you know, at least you know in it, recently it's been a uh, you know they 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 have the Gatsby Days events um, to commemorate. Uh, which they just, I think, uh, they're in the middle of doing, you know, today, they had a, a reenactment of a burning of a, of a model ship or whatever. I think that's kind of interesting how, the, how they've uh, kind of gathered this, uh, this event and, and pinned it as a part of their, their, their local pride. Sure. And so, Mark, ever since 1966, um, the Gatsby Days have been celebrated in Patuxet and around, um, and, and around Cranston, Rhode Island there, uh, where there's a parade, there's a 5K fun run. Um, so if you and I were in, in, in Rhode Island, you know, our kids would have marched with the scouts and we would have got taken our family down there and gotten balloons and cotton candy. There's a craft fair, um, you know, there's fireworks. That, like you said, that today they actually had the burning of a, of a replica vessel that they actually set on fire in the river. Um, and, and so this is something that, um, there's a water fire event that's uh, that's done. Um, it's, it's it's actually very romantic that the boats go up and down. People charter boats to go up and down the river, and they have like almost campfires in the Providence River. It's very pretty. It's it's very um, it's very well done. And so um, yeah, and this has been going on uh, you know since 1966. So everybody in Rhode Island is at least knows the phrase the Gatsby Affair, right? It's um, <laughs> you know. And then as soon as you leave Rhode Island and cross the Massachusetts border or the Connecticut border, nothing. People yeah. haven't, they haven't heard a thing, you know. And so it's, it's in that sense, it has a lot of local knowledge. Um, and some of it's a little bit mythologized and some of it is perhaps a little bit exaggerated. And, uh, you know, every once in a while I get going with people online where I have to encourage them to read my book because they're saying things that aren't exactly accurate. But um, there's 650 footnotes in my book, so it's, it's really written for people who love footnotes. So. Yeah, no, it's very well researched, uh, and you know, like I said, I think it also as part of this response after this incident happened, what I think is also interesting is, like you were talking about, all the different colonies that basically were also watching what was happening, and then also kind of the you know, this, this was an important step in that uh, the lead up towards uh, eventual independence in the sense that you have, you know, committees of correspondence that start to become developed and in discussions between colonies about how this is gonna, um, you know, you know, Great Britain's response to this. Uh, so I thought that yeah. was kind of- And 19th century historians like, like uh, Judge Staples and, and, and Butler, um, uh, sorry, Barnett, sorry, I said his name wrong. Um, you, you know, they certainly thought that the, the committees of correspondence were the great legacy of the Gatsby affair, because you could tie that right to a letter between Sam Adams and um, Arthur Lee. Uh, they started writing to each other saying, look, we don't even know what's happening in the next colony. You know, people in Virginia were finding out about the regulator rebellion in North Carolina from London newspapers. <laughs> so the information's having to go from North Carolina to London, back to Virginia, to just to know what's going on in the next colony. And so, um, you know, one thing that Whitehall did very well is they treated all 13 colonies as very separate entities and didn't have them communicate much with one another. 
um, which was actually very clever. So they didn't have sort of a unified voice that way. And um, so it's, they definitely, and, and there's a chart in my book and you can see how the committees of correspondence grew out of the Gatsby affair. But unfortunately, and we didn't know this till the 1970s, when serious study was done on the committees of correspondence, that these committees were very concerned about being um, accused of treason, and they engaged in very perfunctory type duties and communication. And you look at the names of the people on these committees, and you recognize some of them as being very zealous patriots later. But in 1774 and even into 1775, the committees that grew out of the Gatsby affair are not the radical committees that really drive the revolution later. As much as we wish they were, and we wish that were part of our legacy and that we could brag about that. And like I said, 19th century historians, unfortunately, were wrong about that. Mm -hmm. um, but then they didn't point you to John Allen. And I'm like, who is it who made the Gatsby raid into the Gatsby affair? Who mm -hmm. made it into the big deal that, that we're still talking about 250 years later? And it was John Allen. They make no mention of John Allen. They, um, so he did kind of disappear fairly quickly that by the time uh, Judge Staples is writing his book, he's not even, he's not even on his radar. Um, but at the time, Allen was hugely important. And, and I, I make that argument in my book, you can see. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, it, it, you mentioned earlier that just as a big George Washington fan, and he said that they, he fired off. Did he learn about this from uh, Allen's uh, publication? Or and from newspapers. Likely? Yeah, so Sam yeah. Adams, Sam and Adams took the secular route and got it in the papers for you. And then yeah. Alan got it through the religious uh, community. Yeah. Oh, okay. So between the two of them, they got the word out, um, you know, because there were dozens and dozens of newspapers and a lot of them that just reprinted each other's stories. I mm. mean, they, and they would give credit in the byline, but, um, you know, a lot of it was just reprinted stories, but that's how things did get around. Um, and uh, yeah. And so, uh, and, and also, what was kind of the the greater of, from the uh, crown side or the British side? Um, you know, what was their overall response to this whole thing? Was it uh, anything major, or was it something that they needed to? Oh, uh, how, how did they re respond to this attack? Yeah. So, really, the, the um, by putting Wanton in charge of the Royal Commission of Inquiry, they kind of doomed it right from the start. They, they really would, if they really thought they were going to round people up or send some ringleaders to London, see the way 18th century British justice worked, especially in British North America, they, they aren't trying to publish, punish the whole crowd or the whole mob. They just want to round up the ringleaders and, and make an example of them. And, and capital punishment was done the same way. You had, you had what, 100 or 150 different capital crimes in 18th century England. Um, but you're like, but not everybody was getting executed all the time. They had all these crimes on paper but then they would just occasionally make an example out of somebody. And it was the same thing with these mobs um, because the, the, way that, the way the 18th century English justice was done is if they got stuck, which is they were stuck where the rum was on Dunningston's uh, schooner, Dunningston couldn't come ashore, he couldn't condemn the rum, he couldn't give it back, it, you know, they're stuck, right? So mm -hmm. the way that you deal with 18th century justice is you round up a posse, uh, you and I might call it a mob, or maybe not more nicely, a crowd. And, and the sheriff would head this crowd, and they would go out and they'd get a warrant for their arrest. And they claimed before Buckland shot his gun, they, they claimed they had an arrest warrant. And mm -hmm. Dunningston was very cleverly not going ashore. So I think he believed they had an arrest warrant for him. But this is a standard formula. This is a known formula, right? Um, this is not a great mystery. And, and so they were following a script. And so that was Whitehall's script is to round up the ringleaders. So they were really looking for the person who was called captain and the person who was called sheriff, which is probably Brown and probably Whipple. Mm -hmm. And um, he would, they were looking for those two people. But the only person who came forward with any kind of a testimony was a 19 year old enslaved man named Aaron Biggs. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you'll hear Rhode Islanders call him Briggs because somebody added an R to one of the documents now, thanks to the state archives, they're all online. You can see it with your own eyes. Um, but he, when he was giving a deposition before to the British, he described himself as Biggs, um, which is interesting. I mean, that's a minor thing, but it could be that he was changing his name as part of his self-liberation. Now, when we look back on Aaron Biggs, 
we realize he took advantage of the chaos of the situation to escape slavery. And he used the British Navy as his avenue to escape slavery. As a, there's an extremely interesting article in Rhode Island history that just came out this month, looking at the Black Mariners database. I believe it has 27,000 entries of Black Mariners um, and the different ways in which they liberated themselves from slavery or tried to escape from slavery. And the British Navy was one of them. Um, it's, it's not, and, and it's, we know this. I mean, you even look at the end of the war when George Washington uh, went to New York City and asked Sir Guy Carleton for his 3,000 slaves back, and Carleton said no. So we know that Black people were uh, liberating themselves using um, the, the, the chaos of the situation and the power of the, of the first British Empire. And so Aaron Biggs is an interesting story. And so if, if we do need to pull down some statues and put up some new ones, um, he's an interesting guy. Uh, mm -hmm. There would be one right there. He disappears into the Navy for his own safety. Uh, Admiral Montague had to come down from Boston and personally escort him from the Beaver to Colony House so that he wouldn't be lynched because he was willing to name names and he was willing to name names of powerful Rhode Islanders. The reason they believed his testimony is it checked out. Hmm. So whether he was coached or whether he was personally there, his story checked out. Um, and so Aaron Biggs is an interesting part of the story. His, apparently his mom was uh, Narragansett Indian and his dad was black, um, according to Ezra Stiles. It was a pretty good source. So the, the later president of Yale University was a pastor in Newport uh, during this whole time. The reason we benefit from that is uh, he meets with everybody, um, he talks with everybody, and then he keeps an excellent diary. So he is a historian's dream, right? He loves yeah. to have tea with people and he loves to write it down. And so you couldn't ask for a better guy, right? And then because Stiles' family loved him so much, they made sure his papers were carefully preserved at Yale. So he's a great source. Huh, interesting. Now this, now this whole, the affair, how it's been, we, we talked about how, you know, you have this initial, re, you know, John Allen's uh, 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 sermon and, um, and how it was, it was talked about at that time. And then how people were, were participants were quiet until uh, the 50th anniversary. And then, and then we jumped up to the, the, you know, 1966 where they're doing parades and celebrate uh, in between those time periods. What, you know, how is this affair remembered? You know, you said there's, there hasn't been much, as far as like book length, uh, uh, things written about it, you know, how is this story told or, you know, in that intervening time period? Sure. So I'll hold up this real quickly. Uh, uh, the Honorable Judge William Staples published this book, A Documentary History. What's this, 1845, I believe? And he made 125 copies of this, mostly for his friends. <laughs> uh, he was one of the founders of the Rhode Island Historical Society. And so um, the, the, you can see this book's very fragile. I, I, I'm not even taking it out of its case. Mm -hmm. But uh, so that's that's the first telling of it. And then the Secretary of State republishes this basically verbatim in 1860 as an official history right on the eve of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, and you remember so much of the Civil War was fought on paper long before at Fort Sumter. Um, and, and so New Englanders were uh, going back and forth with Southern intellectuals on who's, who's the legitimate heir of the American Revolution? Who's the le legitimate heir of America's founding? Was it Plymouth Rock or was it Jamestown? You know, mm -hmm. was it the, was it the uh, Jeffersonian leadership or was it Adams leadership? You know, so so much of the Civil War was being fought on paper. So you see some of that. But then after the Civil War, you see this um, kind of juvenile fiction that comes out when we destroyed the Gatsby. Uh, this is James Otis's book. There's others that are good too. The stories of American history, uh, largely written for the children of immigrants um, who are coming to this country after the Civil War. They're coming from autocratic or despotic states, no understanding of democracy or, or voting to change governments peacefully. And so we're wanting to educate them about American history and have them read about American history and about the founders, but also to understand we don't change government with violence, we do it with the ballot box. And so these stories kind of downplay the violence of the Gatsby affair and really talk much more about um, how New Englanders would solve problems in sort of a town meeting kind of way. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting when you see these kind of juvenile fiction, uh, they're downplaying some of the, um, the, the scars of independence, you know. Um, so that came out 
So this is now I'm in the late 19th century. Uh, early 20th century, unfortunately, there's not much, Mark. Uh, I don't have much to point you to in the early 20th century. We were busy fighting two big world wars <laughs> and everybody was busy fighting two big world wars. And it isn't really till the new left emerges in the 1960s and they do some good research on crowd behavior and mob behavior. And that's where we start learning more about how 18th century justice was done with a posse hmm. um, and it's sort of rounding up a posse. And so we learned that from the new left and they weren't trying to make an argument, uh, a sort of a Marxist argument that this was some sort of proletarian uprising. It was clear that um, uh, Rhode Island's elites were behind this. Uh, the men were well-dressed. They had their puffy shirts on, they had their wigs on. Um, this, upri this uprising was not a class uprising. It was, it was being led by the, the finest men of Providence. And so uh, they weren't trying to make that argument. Uh, but I'm thinking of Pauline Mayer's research on this. It's excellent. Um, and, and you can see where I cite her extensively in my footnotes. So the, the new left kind of takes some interest in this again in the 1960s and 70s, and then uh, which is when Lawrence wrote his dissertation, of course, in 1973. Um, and, then, and then that brings us up to the present. So I'm one of the few living <laughs> experts on the Gatsby affair now, right? So yeah. Yeah, no, it's a uh, yeah, it's a uh, a small group of people, but I think that's a uh, uh, pretty neat that uh, you can deep dive so deep in such a, a a small event um, and kind of try and extrapolate uh, larger things from that. Mm -hmm. um, at, at the site today, is there is there any remnants of the Gatsby that uh, exist at the bottom of the bay or? Uh, so Kathy Abbas just got a $30,000 grant to do some more digging. Um, I, I feel like she, you know, lost opportunities, right? Before 1938, before the great hurricane, there might've been a chance to find some things, but it's warm water. It's a wooden ship. Um, the sands have shifted multiple, multiple times there. They did rename Namquid Point, Gatsby Point. And so we're confident that's the spit of land where they came ashore. And, and where the, they ran aground. Um, but like I said, we don't even have Daniel Bond's, um, whatever he salvaged, we don't even have that. Um, for a while there, and, and you can see pictures in Wikimedia Commons, um, we had pieces of Sabin's Tavern where the men gathered that night uh, to melt down some bullets and, and to, um, to gather together um, where they were at the end of Fenner's Wharf. And there's a few other things that are in people in private collections that are privately held. Um, the Rhode Island Historical Society has a banner that was on a float in that Bristol parade in 1826. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there aren't a lot of artifacts to have. Um, Gatsby Point now is just a housing development. You know, you can go and walk down on the beach there, but there's nothing really to see. There's a couple of small placards around Providence, but um, yeah. There, the John Brown's mansion is probably the, the biggest thing that any, anybody had, you know, that we still have his mansion. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, Rhode yeah. Island, yeah, the Rhode Island Historical Society owns yeah. his mansion, yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, no, and so, uh, uh, so you've written this book. This book came out about five years ago. Um, mm -hmm. Is there more to research about this event, or more to or different ways to interpret it? I guess. Um, yeah. You get yeah. On the road at any point. It's interesting you should ask that because, like I said, Rhode Island History has three articles on the Gatsby this month uh, that just came out on their June uh, uh, issue, and I and I met with a, um, a senior at Brown University who's writing a senior thesis on Aaron Biggs, and so <laughs> people are really looking at the extent to which. Um, you know, it's hard to know now whether Biggs was coached um, or whether he was actually there that night. Um, and one of the commissioners muses on that at some length after the hearings are over. Um, the commissioner from New York uh, muses on this in a letter that you can read online. But um, really looking at uh, was the Gatsby effect, you know, and you can see there's some um, editorials back and forth in the Projo in the Providence Journal. In the summer of 2020, uh, during all the Black Lives Matter protests in uh, all over the country, but also in Rhode Island, uh, somebody published a piece that really called that into question. Was the Gatsby stopping human trafficking in Narragansett Bay 
And is that what was at the heart of this? And were that was that possibly Dunnington's orders when they when they were so concerned with what were his orders? What was he supposed to be doing? And we know that rum is intrinsically tied to the slave. You know, this is the triangle trade that we all studied in fifth grade. That that rum and slavery are tied together. It's no mystery to anybody. And so the extent to which so you can read these essays um, on, at gatsby.org. Uh, there's a pre pediatrician in Rhode Island, John Kincannon, who's kept a website up since 1997, at least since 1997, where he was doing this in HTML 1.0, <laughs> you know, back <laughs> in the 90s, you know, where you had to code everything by hand, right? Um, he was putting up this website and he just has mountains of information there, but he's got good search engines. You can find things very quickly on his site. And it, so if you just Google gatsby.org, um, was the Gatsby protecting slavery, or sorry, was the Gatsby over slavery? You can see the editorials back and forth from two years ago. And I think that's what younger scholars are gonna be asking. These are the questions. They're asking the Woody Holton type questions. Um, to what extent was the American Revolution our first civil war? And to what extent was it over slavery? And you look at Dunmore's de declaration um, you look at, like we mentioned, Sir Guy Carlton earlier, you look at African-Americans who then went to New Brunswick, went to Halifax, went to Jamaica, and some even, even back to Africa, who had never even been to Africa. When I say back to Africa, they went to Africa for the first time. Mm -hmm. But um, so we see um, uh, uh, Black colonists being spread around uh, the first British Empire outside those 13 colonies um, where they never went home. Uh, you know, or, or trying to make it home. And I think that's the research that's going to take off after this. Um, and some of it's not done with long form monographs. It's done with a database. Um, East Illinois University, there's a gentleman who made a database there in 2009. And I wish I could find it online. I can't find this database online called the Black Mariners Database, where he traces um, uh, sort of a diaspora of slaves uh, during and after the American Revolution. Uh, so these are the interesting finds for the next generation of historians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think it's kind of interesting. And yeah, it seems like there's, there are some missing pieces of the puzzle. Uh, it'd be great if, yeah, like, yeah, what those orders were and all sorts of, you know, if any of these people were able to, to talk uh, before 1826, uh, it'd be it seems like there's a lot of uh, a lot of places where they could be filled, but like you say, I think that there's some data and some other um, parts of it that can be filled in um, or find out more about that. Um, which is kind of interesting to think about. But yeah, no, it's interesting to think. Yeah, what's it? What inherently is at the the root of this affair? Um, and yeah, how do, how does this also yeah play into the cause that? It eventually grows to be so. Yeah, because Mark, when we look at um, when we look at Alan's sermon, of course, it got published only in cities north of of Maryland, right? Well, those the colonies north of Maryland were the ones that did some gradual abolition. Uh, well, except for Massachusetts, Massachusetts just freed their slaves with a court order. I, I mean, that was actually a court case. But the other thing that the folks bring up that's interesting is the Somerset case was in June of seventy two. It was nine days after this. Um, and so Lord Mansfield um, made it, you know, from the King's bench, he's at Lincoln's Inn, uh, made a ruling that Somerset was free. And the way people in the United Kingdom interpreted that, they sort of interpreted it that slavery was illegal in the United Kingdom. And so how much people knew the Somerset decision was coming, how much they knew how Mansfield was likely to rule on that, that I don't know. That would be an interesting study for future historians to look at that. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we have the 2020 hindsight of Somerset. What did they know in the spring of 72? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and how much did they know about how Mansfield might rule on that? I, I don't know. That's another good question for future historians to ask, or maybe for me to ask when I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so do you have uh, any uh, projects you're working on at the moment uh, related to the revolution or? I'll tell you, whatever I might have worked on before COVID certainly got derailed. I'm an educational technologist, and all of a sudden, everything depended on us and my little team. And so uh, we, we had to kick it into high gear for a couple of years here. And so um, I'm just now 
looking to get back into thinking about my scholarship. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, no, like I said, uh, um, you know, his book is The Burning of His Majesty. Well researched. Uh, it's uh, by Westholm Publishing, uh, part of the Journal of the American Revolution books. And you've uh, blogged with the journal before as well, I believe. Um, so uh, Stephen Park's got some uh, good stuff about, yeah, like I said, often often kind of blown through, but I think that it's, uh, it's a very interesting stepping stone in the, uh, the, lead, up to the, revo- the re- lead up to the revolution. What would you say also, you know, this, because we mentioned the Boston Tea Party is going to happen in 1773, which it seems like there's some similar aspects to it in the sense that you have, um, uh, you know, kind of a lot of the, the Sons of Liberty there in, in Boston. Um, it, 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 do we know any connections between these two events or is it, are these two just totally separate events? Uh, that yeah, so what's interesting is they, they find that they're stuck again, right? Remember we said 18th century justice doesn't know what to do when it gets stuck, right? So they've, they've gone through all the means. So the crown has said, you cannot send this tea back to London. Mm-hmm. And Thomas Hutchinson has said, you have to unload this tea, right? And, and so they're like, fine, we'll unload it, right? Mm-hmm. And so that was sort of the gathering of a posse, uh, whether they dress like Indians or not. Um, I don't, I think Reverend Allen was wrong, but the Rhode Islanders did not dress like Indians. Um, and oh, yeah. you can see <laughs> the painting behind me and the painting behind you does not have them dressed like Indians. Uh, there's <laughs> other accounts that do. But in any case, um, they gathered a posse and they took, they took justice into their own hands, right? And so, in that sense, they're following the same kind of formula of trying to get a situation that's stuck, unstuck. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no state police. There's no National Guard. You have a militia. Uh, you have a sheriff. And you, they can call for a warrant for someone's arrest, or they can call a warrant for some action. And so that I think that's what you have in common. You saw the situation in Rhode Island made them look very weak. By the summer of 1773, it became apparent that nothing was going to happen. They submitted their report and they had gone home. (laughs) And then by December of 1773, you find another situation where they're stuck, uh, where Thomas Hutchinson wasn't going to budge, the Crown wasn't going to budge, and so um, the the a local posse moved the situation along for them. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's interesting how that you know. (laughs) how that uh, type of justice operated seemed mm-hmm. be kind of commonplace as opposed to uh, obviously what we're used to today, so. <laughs> and, and that's what I've been telling groups around the anniversary. I said, what the new left told, told us was that their action wasn't that radical. What my research showed you is it wasn't that unusual. So if this Gatsby raid isn't that radical and isn't that unusual, how did it become an affair, right? How, how did it, and well, Reverend Allen is my answer for you. He's the one who figured out how to make it into an affair. Working with Sam Adams, the two of them together, um, just kept beating the drum and it wouldn't let it alone, mm-hmm. you know, and, and wouldn't let it get swept under the rug. And so the two of them really made it into an affair. No, that's, uh, it's very similar. It reminds me of the, um, uh, in, in the aftermath of the Boston Massacre, uh, where, you know, the, you know, propaganda effect, so to speak, of pushing, uh, uh, you know, turning what was already a, a tragic event into, you know, how's this going to promote uh, uh, their cause? And mm-hmm. you have Paul Revere's uh, uh, depiction of it, and you have all the, you know, um, Warren speeches about it, and you kind of see how they can take, uh, yeah, an, an event and, and use it to, to further their their agenda um sure. which i think is is sounds very similar to uh to, to the gatsby affair as well so sure i remember my first time flying back to, into logan airport on uh, british airways they were talking to british tourists about what they might do in boston and so they're telling them about the freedom trail but they're telling them from a completely different perspective than i'd ever heard growing up in new england and so they're describing the king street riot then they're describing the King Street riot in, in some detail. And I lean over to my wife and I'm like, I think they're talking about the Boston massacre. <laughs> you, know, but you couldn't tell because they were telling it from the grounds perspective. And, yeah. I, and I, thought, 
I thought the John Allen uh, movie on HBO a few years ago, sorry, John Adams movie uh, with, about John and Abigail um, was very well done. I thought showing him defending the soldiers there, I thought that was portrayed very well. Mm -hmm. and that HBO special, yeah. Well, and they, they kind of show you some of that, how the town, you know, at least in those court scenes, uh, you know, intimidating witnesses and all yeah. this kind of uh, local justice also is operating. Um, yeah, and well, well, Mark, what nobody told me was that the, um, the officers, uh, sorry, the soldiers didn't make enough money. They didn't make a living wage when they were deployed in the colonies like this. And so they would work a part-time job and so many of those soldiers worked in the rope walk mm -hmm. and, and, and were taking work away from those local boys. And, and so there, that's where some of this bad feeling was. And so they knew these people and they, they um, what would be a modern day analogy in, in a world of unions would be like uh, scabs, right? Mm -hmm. Where they're kind of crossing the picket lines, right? They're taking our jobs away from us. And, and you know, yeah. So you see where some of the bad feeling would come from. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it also kind of shows you yeah, how, you know, the local, you know, in this seems like it's the local politics, uh, how that influences and mm -hmm. has an impact eventually in international politics. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, uh, it's the hyper localness of it, I think, is really interesting because uh, yeah. it comes down to personalities and, uh, you know, individuals uh, and kind of their choices. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. But uh, anyways, uh, so thank you, uh, Stephen, for coming on here and, and talking to us. Uh, I know I enjoyed this discussion. I learned a lot more, too, about this affair in just uh, this little bit. Um, uh, thanks for coming on here. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, uh, just to let our audience know, um, you know, we got some pretty good events coming up uh, over the next few months. Uh, this September, we're having a, a symposium, which is going to be looking at the international aspects of the revolution uh, at Gatsby's or in Alexandria, Virginia at the Lyceum. So uh, you can check out our website, uh, emergingrevolutionaryward.org for that. Check out our blog. Uh, we had some interesting blog posts go up uh, the past couple of weeks. Um, also, uh, if you're interested in actually going to a site and seeing some of the things, we got a tour coming up in November. Uh, we're taking a bus tour. I think we only have about five or six tickets left um of uh valley forge and monmouth battlefields uh so that'll be kind of neat to do we did our first one last year at trenton and princeton and it was a lot of fun um and uh and yeah so uh, in in two weeks uh we'll be back here so check us out uh, every two weeks here on our facebook page uh but thank you all for joining us thank you Stephen, for joining us and remember the gatsby and uh <laughs> enjoy this 250th anniversary all right Thank you, Mark.